Reach your neighbor. Today's invitation will be offered by Lee King. Thank you, President Courtney. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, new mercies every day that you give us. We pray for uh, warmer weather to come our way. This week might be a little chilly, but uh, we look forward to the new spring, the new beginnings. And uh, I'd also like to lift up the Canapic family uh, to you. As they, uh, they've lost Dr. Dr. Knapnik here this past weekend. Just pray that you'll uh, guide and direct them. We also thank you for this meal to uh, nourish our bodies. We just thought. Also pray that you'll continue to bless our club, that uh, we can serve our communities well. Pray this in his name. Amen. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. I love seeing a full house. So hopefully you enjoy our, our speakers for today. Um, today is National Supreme Sacrifice Day. So this day is to honor those who have made tremendous sacrifices for the state, for the sake and the good of others, as well as those who sacrifice their lives every day for us. We may most readily call to mind the men and women in uniform who have laid down their lives protecting their country and communities. This day also honors those that may have stepped forward during time of crisis to rescue a stranger or a neighbor and gave the supreme sacrifice that day. So today is National Supreme Sacrifice Day. Um, before I turn it over to Secretary Lynn and for the Secretary's report, um, we want to send out a congratulations to Russell Robertson, which was just named as the Wayne County Auditor. So congratulations. Um, next, I do last, I don't want to say last because I got to get this in, but um, I do want to make a mention of the Hearing Missions Foundation. Um, again, so if you are interested in donating to that, if you don't know what that is, you can come up and ask me afterwards. I've, I've read it over and over again, so I don't want to bore everybody. But if you would like to participate and donate to that, I would love for um, to turn this in here shortly. We are a little over halfway of $300 that we need to raise. So again, if you're interested, come see me. And I think that's it for now. So Secretary Lynn, Secretary's report. It is good to have so many guests today. We'll start uh, with in, uh, introductions with Ron Roms just from the podium. Thank you, Lynn. Let's start with two Smitty, Smith, Smithville folks. <laughs> Tom Wackeser and Mary, he, he's a star at the Worcester Community Hospital. And then Meredith Craig, who's with the Ohio Chamber of Commerce. And then we have two commissioners here. Uh, thank you for being here. You can get your tomatoes out. Um, <laughs> Seuss Mail and Jonathan Hofstetter, as well as Dan Starcher, who is our communications uh, for the county. Past President Don Noble has the traveling microphone. We'll start with Tiffany Kessner. Well, again, today I'm going to the second of the Ian Smith. My guest is Dan Glass, engineer for MCTV. Mary Beth Burns. Hi, my name today is Jennifer Piper from the Bay County Police Department. <laughs> Tim Swift. Kevin Meyer from the Assistant Rush Company. She and Ron are getting a rip in the program. 
And we're looking forward to updates from Armando and Erica. Hi, uh, I'm Erica. I'm a Last week, I went to Washington, D.C. to spend, and I went to Kennedy Center. Yeah, we visit a big hall, and there's a big chandelier, the big organ, and I love the tons of egg holes. Yeah, that was a really experience for me, and I went to the uh, White House, and the D.C. Capitol, and yeah, it was big, and everything was white. <laughs> and then I, I didn't hear why here it is, but I didn't find I couldn't find the white house because everything's white. <laughs> and, but this week, last weekend, um, I went to next I moved to the next house family. Yeah, I feel like the day I go back to Japan is coming to me because my I moved to the third house family, so, mm -hmm. but next week we have spring break and I, we are planning to go to Niagara Falls, so I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah and I was in Washington DC. I'm the same weekend at Pericles, but I was in the bed all the time. <laughs> I visited but one Thank you, Don. We have two announcements from the podium, Tom Rumball and Tim Swift. Thank you. Um, flag maintenance day, surprise, surprise. Um, I'm doing a last minute one this Wednesday, March 20th, from four to six. Lee King's gonna be sending out a reminder for you to sign up. If you don't need a reminder, just show up and we'll put you to work. Thanks. <laughs> Good afternoon. Got a little word for you. What's red and white has paint all over it. Currently houses five million paintbrushes, nearly six million paint roller covers, and 438,000 extension holes. And it then get bowled over 10 football fields or 10 times the population of woods that are standing shoulder to shoulder. If you guessed where the Yoda's house would be wrong. <laughs> but if you guessed the woods are dark down these years already on Daisy Lane, you would be correct. We're not, fortunately for you, we're not inviting the whole population of Worcester to do building, but lucky for you, we are inviting you to bring the whole entire Worcester Rotary crew through to our tour of our facility next next coming Monday, the 25th, during what will be our normal Rotary program for lunch and the tour. Because of the fully operating warehouse distribution facility and manufacturing operation, we are going to give tours and rotating tours to the fund 10, 10 to 15 of the lunch room. Of course, as mentioned, we'll be serving lunch as well. So if you haven't already signed up online or in person, please see Lynn or Courtney today to get full access to that tour. There will be a 20 to 30 minute walking tour uh, so wear comfortable shoes and clothes for the shoes as well as on the back of the uh, manufacturing facility. We will provide safety glasses and earbuds. And here's what you could expect to see. Extension pole line manufacturing, paint will recover finishing, automated order retrieval, Warehouse and distribution process, all the while we're in fun packs about the building. Hope to see you there. Thank you. Yeah.
and like you have two teenage daughters, like could you use that big of a house if you know what I mean? So yes. Um, all right. So welcome everyone again. And um, today we have the um, we have our very own Ron Amstis with the state of the county, and Lynn will actually be introducing him today. Thank you, President Courtney. Ron Amstutz is serving his eighth year, one of three of our Wayne County Commissioners. He serves on the Board of Trustees of the County Commissioners Association of Ohio. Prior to that, he served 36 years in the Ohio House and Senate, including two years as Speaker Pro Tem at, in the Ohio House. In recent years, Commissioner Amstutz has focused on strengthening our county's criminal justice system. This includes guiding initiatives aimed at better addressing recovery and successfully re-entering the workforce for persons who fall into or are at risk of falling into criminal behavior. Prior to his public service, Ron worked as a writer, photographer, and bureau editor for the Daily Record. He grew up on a dairy farm in rural Wayne County. Ron is a graduate of Central Christian High School and holds a BA degree in government communications from Capital University. Ron and his wife, Joanne, are members of Worcester Grace Church. They have two grown children and three grandchildren. Ron is a 40 year member of this club. So please join me in welcoming fellow Rotarian Commissioner Ron Amstutz. Thank you, Lynn. Well, I'm not sure if this is good news or bad news. I have a 18 minute speech and it is not 20 after that. So you're gonna, you're gonna hear what the opportunity is in that in just a moment or two. I've trimmed this down to that level and we'll see if I can stay on script. Um, in order to give us a chance to have some interaction uh, at the end of what I'm gonna present, I'm gonna go through a number of topics, quite a few, but it's big county with a lot of things going on. So this will not be everything, believe me. It's gonna focus on county government some, but it's also going to focus on our county generally in a number of ways. So that's that's the game plan I have in mind here. And I didn't bring any rivets, so I don't know about this riveting thing, but I will show you something that has a little bit of a look to it. It's kind of a rotary wheel thing. Uh, I found this from 2003, you know, the, something I did way back then as a sort of background. But the theme I want to talk about is around our people and our places. And that will be sort of the focus of what I'm trying to do here. The um, people part of it is going to have three parts. Our transitioning leadership, our social vitality, and our workforce. So the places part is going to be about our infrastructure, uh, both horizontal and vertical uh, assets that we have in our county. So that's the second phase of what I want to talk about. And you're going to see quite a bit of overlap. Everything's connected, as you know. So there's going to be capital assets that interact with people because we're here to serve people with all those things. So you're going to hear that. <clears throat> all right, let's talk about transitioning leadership. We're experiencing accelerated turnover in our organizational leadership. But that's on both the public and the private sector side. We have a new Worcester mayor. He was here a couple weeks ago to address us. And we have a new mayor in Orville, and we have a number of other new mayors in villages around our county, along with township turnover as well, in not only the top leaders, but also the uh, members of council. So there's quite a bit going on in the public sector on turnover. In county government, we have fully half eight of our 16 uh, elected officials that make up our county team that are turning over in the process somewhere. We just gave our clap to Russell Roberts. So that's an example. And not only that, some of our top level managers are also engaged in turning over. So there's, there's a lot of turnover happening. 
And similar to that, in the private sector, especially the nonprofits, which I will tend to focus on more today, we have a lot of turnover. We have Bill Sharon's, we have the Judy Talcott's, we have Deanna Sticka, and the list is long. I'm just giving you a couple of examples of folks that are new to their positions or step other people that are stepping away from their positions in this case. So to get the picture, we are experiencing a sea change in leadership. So the question is, are we in danger of melting down because of this? No, I would say the opposite is the case. We're seeing strong, younger leaders coming onto the scene, and this is a good thing. You can celebrate it. The state of our leadership team is strong and getting stronger. So I'm pretty happy about that. Let me give you a couple of examples. I'm looking down here at John Hofstetter. He's in his second year as a county commissioner. Um, I can go through the list. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on a few. We already introduced uh, Tiffany Kester is new, and she just introduced uh, Nicole Williams. I will get it right. Uh, <laughs> brand new at the counseling center. So Tiffany's at the no, I'll get it back. Tiffany's at the counseling center. Nicole is at the mental health recovery. I'm old. I got a lot of coaching needed. We have over here, we have Andy Michael. How long have you been on the job? Uh, a little three years. Thanks, uh, yeah, so he's new on the scene at the OSU campus for Worcester. Um, I could go on. Oh, Sarah Brink is new at the, uh, pretty new at the Main Center for the Arts. And uh, I could go on and on and on, but I, I'll stop there. So these are relatively young, very high quality leaders. Well, everybody's looking kind of young these days to me. But <laughs> um, so let's move from our leadership team to the rest of the team. Social vitality is the kind of topic I've given this, and it also plays a lot in the workforce. So how are we doing there? We have much to celebrate for which we need to be thankful. We have more than one high quality hospital, excellent health care for most of our people, more than 200 churches and synagogues are actually in a church here. And we have an exceptionally strong social services network. And again, I could go on, but that's an introduction to that topic. We do have our challenges though. We need to turn those into opportunities. And what I'm calling social vitality here is, uh, it's actually closely aligned with workforce, but brings the big picture, comprehensive quality of life into view, the whole spectrum of requirements for healthy living. We recently learned in a local community survey, and Nick, Nick Cascarelli is here, uh, that the health department did that, uh, or kind of led, I think that's the right way to say it. Uh, we found that mental health is a top concern of our community. So the, one of the questions is, is that because of this pandemic that we just went through and how we handled it? Well, I think partly, but it does go well beyond that. So then last week, my heart doctor, uh, Dr. Ofori, he's famous around here, as an immigrant from Ghana, he was giving a hard talk at the Pines, and he shared a quote that uh, I actually found that there's a like seven brothers or, that started the Mayo Clinic. And he gave a quote from one of the brothers. I found another quote that I really like as well, similar. It is a poor government that does not realize that the prolonged life, health, and happiness of its people are its greatest asset. That was clear back in 1919, and it plays very truly up today. So for me, the greatest meaning behind this whole thing of social vitality is, uh, the way I understand it, is that it's all-encompassing health, environmentally, relationally, spiritually, occupationally, physically, personally, and even global, 
And that's really the rotary mindset, isn't it? That's our mindset. So let's go look at some facts. We have an aging population. This is nationally, but it's very true here. We have a lagging birth rate, in part driven by the folks having babies, dysfunctional families too often. Uh, we have an employee shortage and a failure to thr thrive often in the workplace, even, either because folks never even get into the workforce or they drop out early uh, or they really should or they don't succeed once they are in the workforce. So that's a pretty big challenge to um, social vitality. And it all interacts heavily with workforce. Beyond these demographic dynamics in our workplaces, we see our employees bringing the rest of their life issues, good, bad, and ugly sometimes, to work with them. So the question is, what's the state of our workforce? Well, I should have Mary Beth come up and give this part of it, but uh, we actually have a very strong, excellent work pool. And why is that? Well, we wouldn't be that. Let me tell you where we are. We're, for years now, have been at the top of the pinnacle of like 543 micropolitans across the nation. And that's based on objective census data. So it's not something you can you know, play games with. And we, we can't be at that level if our people aren't strong and we don't have a good workforce. So it's really a big positive. We could have a whole series of rotary programs on how we could take what we have that's so good and make it great. Maybe we'll do that sometime, or maybe we can have discussion about it towards the end here if you like. All right, I need to move on to places. So let's talk a little bit about the infrastructure assets that we have in our county, the more tangible side of our assets. We have a lot to celebrate there too. Positive change is happening, and some of that change has us up against those some real challenges. So let me talk about a couple. I'm gonna use this transition because this is kind of horizontal moving people around, but it's a people thing too. Um, our county government and the city of Worcester government is working together. We're working together with Community Action to take the transit programs we have now to the, the higher level. ODOT is funding a project that's just getting underway and it's looking pretty promising to find a model for how to do transit, public transit here in our county. And the idea is to bring together a pilot that's been running for a couple of years with Worcester's looping transit that they have, plus figure out how that's going to interact with a bunch of other transit like taxi services, Gilcrest, there's a whole list of folks that are providing transit. We have to figure out how that runs alongside of what we might end up with in this project. So it's a pretty interesting project. It's gonna run probably the rest of this year and then we'll try to deploy it next year depending on what we find. Well, our county is known for manufacturing productivity. We are good at making things. Sorry, Mary Beth, I stole some of your content. Probably Trace's content, but you're going to see more of it here. It's good stuff. Um, <laughs> um, you know, that's the driving part of our economy, making things. That's, that's what the rest of our economy needs to support and does support and is really very dependent on, including government services. And by far the largest factory floor in Wayne County is our agricultural land. It's on that that we grow plants and animals for food. And this land is a major asset. Relatively recent data shows that our county's land is still about 70, showed about 79% farmland geographic, but Um, we have a lot of threat there. We 81% of our land, our farmland, 
has soils that are nationally significant. If you go around the country and look at the farmland, it's only about 39% of our national farmland is has soils that are, are of a high quality. And so we have something pretty special here, but this land is slipping away to other uses. And there's evidence that we are gradually losing prime farmland every year, primarily to low density residential development. We're trending toward becoming Medina County. We've developed a number of tools uh, to try to sustain our production agricultural base, but more is needed. One of the basic strategies is to guide development and redevelopment to our cities and villages where we have uh, centralized wastewater treatment that allows much more efficient use of our land. I'm gonna mention a, a couple of serious threats to our factory floor. Uh, our cultural individualism actually is one of those. It's kind of intangible, it's really important. Land use by landowners without accountability to the community contributes heavily to loss of farmland. And that's kind of how we roll here in Lincoln. Barring the Becky Foster phrase there, it's how we roll. She loves them. Um, so there's the other threat. We are seeing projects that eat 400 acres of farmland at a bite, and more than one project is developing here in our county. And that's taking sun to make food, taking sun to make industrial electricity. I don't see that as a good use of our land. <clears throat> so anyway, um, that's a kind of a downer. So I'm gonna go back to the positive here and for the next few minutes, actually seconds, I'm gonna just stop talking and let you see some things. All right, Tim, I, I guess I forgot the brush. So we'll have to go see it in person next week. Instead. All right. Some of that is pretty kind of what I talked to you about before those slides was kind of controversial. So I'm going to throw in something pretty positive here because we have so much that is positive. I'm going to go to another positive. It's a proactive thing. Government tends to be a little reactive. Oh, here we're being proactive. Sterling is a little village up between Ritman and Creston, in the north part of our county, they have a lot of septic systems that are not doing the job and there's a serious environmental problem there. So we are in the process of getting ahead of that using a lot of federal ARPA money uh, to install a central wastewater system for that community. Uh, that's something that it's just rolling out. We've had a couple of public meetings and it's gonna take a while for this actually to happen, but we, we think it's very important. Otherwise, the EPA will mandate it like they have most of the other sewer plants that this county runs are too small to actually um, balance the, their budgets a lot of the time. Now our airport's another great asset that we have. It's a county airport and we have uh, we just buttoned up a grant project that put a new taxiway the whole length of our runway. And we have a, a great runway that's the envy of many, many counties. We have a lot of jet traffic because of the quality of our airport. But uh, what's developing now is a, an opportunity to maybe do some vertical construction, some hangars. Uh, we are not certain yet, but it looks promising that the state legislature, which is doing the state capital budget as we speak, very slowly and dysfunctionally, but they're doing it, um, 
and we have a place in line for hangar and construction, uh, a, a grant that we're, we're hopeful will come through. So that's a positive. And since we're talking a little bit of vertical here with those hangers, here is another thing. In Fredericksburg, we have a, a new Marx Tower that we spent, Sue's smiling through gritted teeth because we, we spent years trying to put the funding together and then find a place for this uh, Marx Tower. But it, it's, uh, as you can see, that was uh, when it was being constructed and should be lit up here very shortly. The uh, value to this is, is pretty big. It's going to help fire, EMS, the sheriff, the state patrol, ODNR, um, all the state agencies that, that have a need for radio services, uh, ODOT included. So this is going to be uh, pretty helpful because that's in a very low area that doesn't have radio signal. Uh, and now we're going to have it not only there, but in that whole area. So that's that's uh, another thing that the county has been working on, mainly Sue and we now. And then we have the, this biggie, housing, putting it in the right place. That's a challenge. Again, I'm going to say centralized sewer services help you use your land more efficiently, and that's what we need to try to continue doing, but doing a better job. Of. We've uh, been using the partnerships, including Mary Beth's operation, her team, to do community reinvestment areas in some of our smaller communities around uh, the county. We have Shreve, we have um, Downton, we have something going in Smithville now, and others that are showing interest in this. And the, and the reason this is useful is because when you put an investment in existing um, building structures, or even building new in a distressed area, that increased tax value gets discounted. Uh, so that's incentive to, to do reinvestment. Worcester's been doing it for quite a while, and, and Orville has the CRA too, but we need it in some of our smaller, and even some of our uh, central sewer areas that already have development outside of the cities and villages. Let me give you a little, Another tool is land, the land bank that we've had is fairly new. Worcester wanted it, and they, it was a good idea, and it's been running now for a while. Uh, this is an example in Worcester of a building that looks a lot nicer now. It helps improve the neighborhood that can do something like that. And in Orville, we did a uh, teardown of a place I used to have, sometimes have lunch back when I was uh, living there. Uh, and that was made into open space, and maybe we'll have some future use beyond parking, but uh, it's in the downtown area. It's very, it's an important area. That building could be salvaged. All right. The biggest project by far that the county's had in a number of years is our, our uh, Justice Center project, which houses not only the jail, but the sheriff's office and our emergency management agency, as well as uh, our dispatch services. So, this is a big project. It's a very big project. Uh, and we've been working on this for a long time. Um, we had some, well, let me just kind of tell you where we're at. This is this morning. Uh, the uh, parking lot that's needed is under construction on the north side of Larwell Street. That's coming along uh, rather well. And that's important because we're going to do some of the, the next part of the project is going to be that's a pretty big chunk of the existing parking lot at the Justice Center that will have an expansion. And that's scheduled to um, break ground in just a couple months here. So uh, the, that's the first phase. The next part of the project will be to take the existing jail and turn it into more dormitory style, lower security uh, spaces in the existing jail. So it's gonna take a couple of years to get through that, that construction and reconstruction. And we thought we were gonna be successful in establishing the funding for this with putting together over $10 million of federal ARPA funds and 
a $15 million state grant that we've secured, plus a pretty healthy uh, set aside in our capital budget. And then we saw what's happened across the country. The cost of jails has escalated almost to double. So now we're going to have to borrow uh, and bond the remaining cost of this. So that's the bad news. But the better news is two years ago, we retired the county general debt. So we, we were debt free at the, in the general area for our, our county. And uh, so we have some capacity to, to do that. Although we just found out today that it's going to cost us $1.5 million in debt service payments probably per year for like 20 years. All right. Um, since I was talking money, I'm going to go to a little bit more, just a quick snapshot here. Our general fund uh, last year was 35 and two thirds million dollars. Okay. Um, that is supported primarily by the sales tax, but other funding sources as well. And if you look on the right side of that pie chart, you'll see at 52, that is the the percentage of the majority of our fund that goes to our justice system when you put the sheriff's operations and the rest of the justice system, which is courts and prosecutors and uh, um, the clerk of courts, a whole array of folks that are involved in that, you get over half of our general fund uh, is is uh, directed in that way. And then if you put together all our funds, we're up to close to $125 million. Uh, and that includes other funds that are available to and used. We have quite a bit of grant funding for our justice system that also comes into play when you look at all the funds. We have over 100 funds in the county. Uh, so we also have ministerial involvement with uh, MRDD's funds and children's services. And also our county engineer that does our highways has a, a over $8 million dollar budget that shows up in our offense. So that's a little bit about our finances. I didn't figure you'd want to spend too much time on that, but that might generate a question or two as well as we go forward. All right, I want to end with uh, another gem that's developing here, right here in Worcester. The Arts District is part of our wonderful downtown. And anchored there is, uh, well, that's a little map out of the city's comprehensive plan uh, of the uh, arts district as it's forming up. But the anchor at the core is our main center for the arts. Of course. And I'm bringing this up partly because uh, the county owns some buildings that are um, transitioning. We have local roots in a, in a building there on Walnut Street that is actually moving over across the street below South Street to Ride On and we'll share space with Ride On. And you can see construction there uh, in the picture that's already underway for that, for that move. And then across Walnut Street to the west, we have the now empty Red Cross building no, I'm saying that wrong. It's the <laughs> the Red Cross building is where the health department is now. And the uh, building that you're seeing here is the uh, vacant health department building. Okay. And you can see Wayne Center for the Arts just off to the left there. So I want to get into some discussion here. It's quarter till. So I'm going to wrap this up. To see what the future of those buildings will be. We're investigating and planning right now. We have a lot of community input on that. But as threatened, we can have some discussion if you want to, or you can go home early. But uh, I hope I generated some people saying, "Oh, well, what did you mean by that?" Or can you explain this a little bit more? Or yeah, you're way off base there. What? Here's an idea you ought to be thinking about. So, what do you want to talk about? Lynn's got the microphone. Now, you mentioned with the, those two vacant or soon to be vacant buildings, 
Could you tell us what some of the possibilities are? What some of the things that are consideration of for the two buildings? Sure. We're not too far along in what that is. What actually the stage we're in right now is we have uh, an EPA funded, actually they're doing it. They're paying the contractor to look and see if there's any asbestos in the building. We don't know that. And that could affect its usability going forward in terms of what the renovation might, might take. But um, I mean, I could say there's a lot of possibilities we already have culinary going in that area. There might be something there, but I think the local roots building would probably make a lot more sense because that's a great kitchen. But there are various visual arts, uh, maker spaces, uh, other workforce development kinds of things that might, you know, workforce is kids, but it's also adults that are where they need to be at too. So those are things that could possibly make a lot of sense in an arts district. But, uh, there are many other ideas too. Actually, that building was a church, and the Church of the Nazarene has sent us a letter saying, "Hey, we're interested in repurposing this somehow for the good of the community." Uh, we don't know where that's going yet either, but we'll probably use our community improvement corporation to do whatever's going to be the next use for that building. Good question. Thank you. All right, then we get out a little early. Yeah, that's a deal. That's a deal. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Well, um, you can probably add this to your list of other collections, but in appreciation of your time with us today, we'd like to present this with the rendition of the Rotary Wheel with the four way test in the back. It's made locally by the students of the village now. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so next week we are at Worcester Brush. Um, tour time, uh, there the start, the first tour time is gonna be 11.30. Um, that time slot is pretty much full. So um, 12, 12.30, um, one o'clock, if you're interested in signing up for those times, come see me. Um, you're welcome to still come at 11.30 and just eat lunch that time and then um, do the tour afterwards. Um, also, we still, um, have quite a bit of people that haven't participated in every Rotarian every year yet. So I know we didn't send letters physically in the mail, but it got by email. Um, if you're still interested and in, uh, participating in that, um, you can still turn in your money. We'll always take your money. We're not going to turn it away. So um, that is always as welcome. And then um, lastly, I just kind of wanted to touch base on Erico and Armando. We have them here every week and it's great to see them. And if you are, as the weather starts turning, start to going places that you think that they would be interested in, please don't hesitate to reach out and, and invite them um, with you. So as um, Erica said, she's not much longer until you guys go back to hometowns or home states or home countries. And so um, all of those, you know, um, so we, we want to have the best experience for them here. So I think with that, we stand adjourned. So thank you.